Welcome to the Giving Voice to Depression podcast, produced in partnership with Mental Health America of Wisconsin. We are your co-hosts, Bridget and Terry. Each week through intimate, candid conversations with guests, we explore different perspectives on and experiences of depression. We keep it real because the illness is real. We keep it hopeful because there truly is hope in spite of what depression tells you. We are not experts or therapists. We're sisters and best friends who live with depression and have interviewed hundreds of others who do as well. By sharing stories of lived experiences, we expose depression for the lying bully it is. Hello, Bridget. Hi, Terry. Last week, we observed Veterans Day, and our podcast focused on the mental health of the nearly 22 million veterans living in the United States, according to the last census numbers. Our guest, psychiatrist Dr. Mike McBride from the VA in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, our hometown and where the podcast is produced. Dr. McBride spoke about the unique culture and needs of American military veterans and how the pandemic is intensifying PTSD symptoms and contributing to increasing depression, feelings of isolation, suicidal thoughts, and attempts. Today we're switching gears, and instead of just speaking to any veterans who might be listening, we're focusing on how family members and other civilians can step up and support the veterans in our lives. Dr. McBride, a veteran himself, offers timely advice as he gives his voice to depression. Dr. McBride reminds us that 2020 is an unprecedented time that we're all just trying to get through without the benefit of a template or blueprint. He says for many vets, pandemic life has worsened avoidance and isolation, what he calls two hallmark symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, which many veterans live with. My veterans joked early on last spring that was, when everyone went into a shutdown, they joked about, well, we're already conditioned for this. In fact, one of my veterans had a funny statement. He goes, there are only two populations that are really prepared for uh, a quarantine. That's combat veterans and convicts. And that's true to a point. But I think that as time goes on, as time has gone on, even those veterans who are comfortable with isolation are still, uh, are, I think, are showing more signs of, of depression uh, because of the disconnect from human relationships. And that's, that's a very serious concern. So we asked what civilians need to understand that maybe we don't about veterans and how we can support them, and in particular, their mental health. That's a very good question. I'm just thinking about the best way to articulate that. And I'm thinking of my veterans who will who will be the first to kind of point out this disconnect that they feel with the civilian world. And that's just because we have to face it as a, a cultural difference. Uh, it's not that the community doesn't care. They do care. It's just that they don't have the same cultural understanding of, uh, of the veterans world. Contributing to that lack of understanding is the fact veterans are literally trained to hide what they may be feeling and to carry on. That can not only make it hard to know if or when a vet is struggling or in need of support, it also creates resistance to their reaching out. All the time, Terry, that's that's spot on. The, The military trains people to put the mission first above their own needs. Mission comes first, and so you're taught that it's a value not to be sick, not to go get help, not to ask for things for your own individual self, but you're working as a unit. You're always thinking, what's, what does my unit need? What does the mission need? How do I put that first? And the, you know, the longer you're in the service or the more uh, you know, trained you are, the more you really incorporate that value. So many veterans, it's so hard for them to ask for help. Which makes it even more important that we learn and develop ways to check in and offer any needed help. McBride suggests three ways to do that. And so 
what's important, I think, to number one, if you have a loved one who's a veteran, neighbor, friend, is it's important to kind of uh, have those conversations with them about their military experience. I think sometimes people are hesitant to ask them about, you know, tell me about your, your service in the military. What was it like when you were in the Army? What did you enjoy? Uh, people sometimes are afraid to ask those questions or to have that conversation. I would say the majority of my veterans are eager, in fact, are are just itching to kind of share their story of what it was like to serve their country. They're very proud of it. And so we need to kind of acknowledge that. Help them tell their story. Tell me about your service. What did you like? To show me something about it. That type of interest goes a long ways to building uh, a sense of trust. It also shows that veteran that people do care um, because that, what I'll hear from veterans often is that they'll come back from a deployment and someone will say, well, hey, that was something. Uh, was, it, was it difficult? And within a, a moment, they're already saying, well, did you watch the Packer game? Or where are we going to go have dinner now? There's just a lack of real kind of an interest in wanting to hear that story. So, As a listener of this podcast, you are probably well aware of the impact of trauma on our mental health and hopefully also of the power of being able to talk, to the extent that feels safe, about the events that have shaped and altered us. Right, yeah, who said it? Was it Mr. Rogers? Someone said that if we can talk about it, we can fix these problems. And if if it's part of the human condition, we can talk about it. And if we can talk about it, we can fix it. Moving on now to Mike's next suggestion for supporting veterans in general, and especially during this pandemic. Number two, I think is, and I think our country's done a better job of that too, certainly compared to the Vietnam generation, and that's showing appreciation. And I think it does help to to tell people, I appreciate your service and and your sacrifice. I think that's the other part of it that that the civilian world. Um, should inquire about, like, that, the sacrifice that you went through during your service is important that we know what that was. So, you know, to talk about that. We appreciate your service. We appreciate your sacrifice. Dr. McBride's own sacrifices include ending his practice as a child psychiatrist to be available for five deployments, four with the Army and one with the Navy, and to focus on caring for his fellow veterans. Well, I mean, I look back. There's, and people would will say, "Do you? What do you regret?" Because it, it, it's taken a toll. I've lost my practice. I don't get a chance to see kids anymore, and I miss it every day. I, I want to be a child psychiatrist every day, but when I think about it, I need to be working with veterans because this, this population is a, is, is it's a culture. This military veteran. Um, world is a culture to itself, and I think being a part of it now, I understand why it's important to have people who understand that culture to connect and work with veterans in their, in their recoveries. McBride says the third thing veterans want and need from civilians is support. So the civilian world, working with veterans, interacting with veterans, we want, you know, veterans don't want a handout. They want they want to be able to thrive in ways that, you know, are true to themselves. So we want to support that. So the, the, that third point would be how can we as a civilian world support our veterans as they continue to adjust to the civilian world? How can we help them be successful in, in the school setting or in a workplace or in a neighborhood? Um, I just think that there's a lot that we can do, but we have to kind of work with our veterans. As an example, McBride shares about how a neighborhood near his showed compassion and awareness over the 4th of July holiday. We know that that's a time when lots of people enjoy using fireworks. Well, for a lot of veterans, especially combat veterans who've been exposed to explosions, that can be a very triggering time. That's, that can be a a very difficult time for them uh, to get through, and that's the the irony there is they can't they can't really enjoy and celebrate their nation's independence because their PTSD is being triggered by you know careless use of 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 fireworks by you know unknowing neighbors, and so this neighborhood put signs up in their yard that said uh, we have 
veterans in our neighborhood, be you know conscientious or careful with your fireworks. So it was a it was a message, a public message to everybody that hey, let's just be aware of the fact that there are veterans in our neighborhood, and let's let's be considerate of them. And that was seen by veterans and appreciated. Another tip directed toward the family members of veterans goes back to the fact vets might be reluctant to reach out if they're struggling. McBride says family members can reach out for them. As an example, he shared about a young couple he supports via video sessions. He says the veteran, who was Special Forces and a Green Beret, has very serious PTSD. Well, he's reluctant to get care for himself, trauma processing, the type of therapy that we know can be very beneficial. But to do that is hard. That's like going into an operation without an anesthetic. And so he is he's ambivalent, he's avoidant, and I, we understand that. But she's not. So I asked him yesterday, and they're both on the video, I said, what if your wife and I met virtually so that I could help train her on things that she can do when you're having a bad day, when you're having a moment of your PTSD is exacerbated. I know if we can if we can train family members to understand and respond, that's much better than you know having uh, you got to run out here and see me at the VA. I think we're better off as a system that if we were to pivot and focus more on helping families and friends understand this and give them skills to help their loved ones, I think we'd be in a, in a much healthier state. When talking about mental health, PTSD, veterans, and a pandemic, suicide prevention has to be part of the discussion. A recently released report from the VA's Office of Mental Health and Suicide Prevention found that the suicide rate for veterans was one and a half times the rate for non-veteran adults, even after adjusting for population differences in age and sex. The number of veteran suicides exceeded 6,000 each year from 2008 to 2017. And firearms were the method of suicide in 70.7% of male veteran suicide deaths and 43.2% of female veteran suicide deaths in 2017. Our you know, veteran culture is a, a gun culture, and the majority of veterans own guns, sometimes multiple guns. What we want, and sometimes it scares veterans because they feel that, you know, that there's an effort to you know, restrict their gun access, but that's not it. What we want to do is res- restricting access in the sense of when someone's in crisis, that that gun is not readily available to them. And so safe storage is, is what I'm looking for so that they can keep the weapon out of the hands of children and keep the hands out of the weapon of those who may be in crisis Means restriction during times of crisis. It's a critical component of suicide prevention. And it's like there seems to be an understanding that securing, say, a bottle of potentially lethal medication during a crisis is a good idea. But when guns are involved, it can be a really tricky topic to broach. Fortunately, Dr. McBride has had that talk enough times with enough veterans that he knows what works. Well, it is hard, but we have to have the conversation. I think that's the point, is that how to have these conversations without making people feel as if we're somehow against that Second Amendment, when what we are doing is saying, look, just with kids alone, you know, I, veterans, I can get them to respond to me when, when I ask them about their firearm and whether if a child in their house can get access to it and how do we protect that child from that weapon. Then I get the veteran to go, you're right, you know, I can't have a loaded weapon um, under my bed because I've got a three-year-old and that three-year-old can pull a trigger. So I'm, I'm going to have to be more thoughtful of, of how to, you know, safely store that weapon. And then the other point is, you know, sometimes I have to say it in that way to people like, okay, I'm not worried about you, but I'm worried about other people in your house who might have a mental health problem. If you have an adolescent who's going through an emotional distress, whatever it is, they are at risk because of the impulsivity. So we want to restrict their access to a weapon that has a very, you know, lethal outcome. 
And so then I can engage them and go, okay, I'll, I'll keep that weapon secure to protect the ones that I love. That's when I can really get them to respond and, uh, and make a change perhaps in some of their behaviors. Before ending our conversation, we asked Dr. McBride if he had anything he'd like to say directly to veterans who might be listening. During a pandemic, contentious and stress-provoking election season, and just one week after Veterans Day. Well, I do. And, and first of all, thank you for what you're doing for all the, the listeners there and to bring attention to depression and mental health needs and to focus on veterans today. I would want to make an appeal to the veterans who may be listening in that our country is going through a difficult time and our country needs to have healthy veterans leading the way in this community based on the values that you learned in the military through those leadership skills. We need to come together. We need to heal. We need to work at improving our communities. And veterans can be in the lead on that. And I encourage every veteran to take that step. There it is again. If we can talk about it, we can fix it. So, you know, to be able to talk and to be heard is such a primal base need. It's such a place to start. Over and over again, we hear that. And one of the places that we can talk and be heard, even if we're not ready or willing to share with the people in our actual physical life, is a crisis line. And I want to repeat the number that we always say, which is 800 273-8255. That's the Suicide Prevention Lifeline. But if you press 1 when you dial that number, 800-273-8255, press 1, and that is a connection to a line specifically for veterans, their families, and friends. For any veteran who prefers to text, 838-255 is the veteran text line. Thank you, Dr. McBride, for all the work you're doing and for teaching all of us, um, some simple doable steps that we can apply to opening up our heart and our ears to the veterans in our lives. And as a veteran yourself, we thank you for your service and your sacrifice. One other point I want to make, and Bridget, this is something really special that happened this weekend. A grade school, and I'm not going to say how old I am, grade school is a really long time ago, grade school friend, her mother recently died. And the family decided to have donations made to this podcast because they appreciate the beginning of the discussions and the taking the lid off that box that has been sealed for so many of us because of stigma. And we had an interesting exchange about how many kids go home to something they don't talk about, you know, and some of that is physical abuse and some of that is substance abuse and some of that is mental health or mental illness, um, challenges that that can really make for an unstable and or scary childhood. And what a different world it would have been if we were all able to say just like, wow, things were really quite wild last night or, you know, hey, you look like you haven't slept in days, what's going on at home, it could have changed our lives. So no, we didn't. We just didn't. No, no one did. Everything was under lock and key. Mm-hmm. It was like, a, you know, it was, a, it was as if there was a pact about secrets, you know, within the family that they stayed within the family for most of us. Without ever really even being told. I don't remember hearing that. Exactly. I guess it's don't air your dirty laundry, you know, but yeah. Anyway, we are grateful to that family. For their support, we are grateful to everyone who shares on this podcast because those are the stories, those are the the conversation starters that are changing the dynamic and and reducing stigma. And to everybody who listens because you're part of it. It, We're all part of it now. And we're just very touched and grateful. We truly hope that our podcast brings a little more understanding, helps you better articulate your experience of depression, or better understand how to support someone else's. We invite you to join us for daily posts on the Giving Voice to Depression Facebook page and on Twitter and Instagram at Voice Depression. It is a comfort to be among fellow travelers on depression's dark road. And remember, if you're struggling, speak up. If someone else is, listen up.